so with that, I'd like to offer, um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Kevin. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kulkarni, uh, to Simon Hogan, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. It rekindles old visits I used to make to Monash when I was first elected to Parliament as a young politician back in 1976, well before any of you were born, probably. Uh, and I used to be in one of these lecture halls around here trying to espouse things about Liberal Party policy and it was very hard to get a word in, I tell you. The first time I was here I left covered in fruit, tomatoes, you name it, but I made a commitment then that every year about the same time I'd come back. And what was interesting over my 23 years in politics was how the student population changed from being terribly radical and miserable and vocal to being a lot more conservative and concerned about things of the future. So it's nice to come back to a quieter environment. Secondly, I welcome the opportunity because I've been speaking to some of your senior people here at Monash, uh, heads of department, etc., about the mental health, the good mental health of your peers in the medical profession in whatever particular discipline they operate. And as chairman of Beyond Blue, I've got to say to you, when we did a survey recently, the results were frightening. Not surprising, but frightening. Why do I say not surprising? Because for some time now I have known that so many in the medical profession are themselves mentally stressed, are tired, suffering depression, many are alcoholics, and sadly the suicide rate is quite high, particularly among female doctors. It was reinforced with me because I well remember when I was a young man, uh, still at home with my family, we used to go down to a family doctor who operated even then in a clinic, and my father telling me when I was about nine or ten that our local doctor, whose name I won't mention, had just taken his own life the night before. And that was my first experience of the medical profession having trouble dealing with the things that surrounded them. When I was Premier in 1999, at the last Premier's conference I attended, I went up to try and introduce a body like Beyond Blue throughout Australia. And unfortunately, I couldn't get on the agenda. But what happens at those Premier's conference? On the night before, you go up and you have dinner at the lodge with the Prime Minister. And it's a very harmonious discussion. You don't, politics doesn't enter into it, so it doesn't matter whether you're Labour, Liberal or Calathumpian. You talk about anything you like. But on the way back down the hill, I was talking to the Premier of Tasmania. Some of you might recall his name was Jim Bacon, died recently. And he came to me and he said, look, I know you couldn't get this, mission, this motion up on the agenda today, but I want you to know I will do everything I can to support you in establishing a national body. He said, my sister, who was a doctor, took her life several years before. Very young doctor. This was a young man, younger than I. In fact, I remembered then that I used to go around to their house and play tennis, and his sister and I were regular competitors. So, in one sense, nothing's changed. And because as we destigmatise depression and mental health, more and more people are putting their hands up for assistance, which is good. But it puts a lot of strain on the medical profession. More importantly, when it puts strain on our front line, being the doctors, we've got to make sure that the health of the doctors is as healthy as possible. Now, a few years ago, I was attending a conference of the National Medical Students Association somewhere up north and I heard your young president speaking at that conference. I followed him, a boy by the name of, a young man by the name of uh, Michael Bonning. Uh, Michael Bonning is now qualified, he serves in the Navy. I was so impressed with what he was saying about the future of young doctors that I appointed him to the board of Beyond Blue at a very young age of about 24 or 5 and he's still serving with us today. Uh, worried as we were, we last year, or the year before, commissioned a survey of doctors to try and understand better the condition of their health. We sent out over 40,000 surveys. Now, doctors are not very good people, normally, 
in responding to surveys. In fact, in the marketing world, if you get a 4% response to a uh, direct mail campaign, you've done very well. We had about 14,000 responses. 14,000 which represented 27% of all surveys that went out. And that survey took about an hour to complete. That alone gave us an indication that doctors themselves were genuinely and seriously concerned about their own welfare. Now, Professor Kulkarni is going to take you through some of the findings. I'm just going to mention a couple of them to you just so you have an idea of what we're talking about and why it's important for you as medical students not only to understand what you're getting into but as this, not that question, but the question that was up there before about how you deal with stress you can address and I'm going to give you a couple of ideas. I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes then throw it open to questions, answers and abuse whichever comes naturally to you and then I'll leave it to those who are better qualified than I to speak. But just listen to these findings. One in five medical students, one in five and one in ten doctors had suicidal thoughts in the past year, compared with one in 45 in the wider community. Not only doctors, but more importantly medical students as they try to deal with the pressures, at times the discrimination that's associated with your studies. More than four in ten students and a quarter of doctors are highly likely to have a minor psychiatric condition. 3.4% of doctors are experiencing very high psychological uh, disorders. When you have a look at the particular disciplines, percentage of doctors by specialty who are highly likely to have a minor psychiatric disorder, perhaps not surprisingly, oncology, oncologists, rank at 33.9%, a third, which I guess is not surprising when you're dealing with cancers, when you're dealing with people fighting for their lives, when you're dealing with parents who have got children who are potentially dying, but it gives you some indication that while your profession is highly thought of and highly respected, it does carry a very real burden for you if in fact you don't get your yins and yangs right so that you can do your work, divorce yourself from your work to get a balance in your life. Now quite clearly as students, particularly after you've finished your studies and you go into hospitals in that first or second year, conditions then can be terribly, terribly tried. And in fact, it's true to say that in a lot of hospitals, there still exists a fair degree of bastardisation by those who have gone through the system and now senior people imposing on you, the youth, this sort of mentality that says, because we were bastardised, it's only right we bastardise you, we try and work you long hours, we try and run you down, and ultimately you get depressed. I launched a program last year and did an interview with a journalist in Sydney who said to me uh, she was happy to do the interview because the week before her best friend who was a female medical student had taken her life. She'd had enough. She just wanted to get out. So please understand that this profession is highly honourable, highly necessary, particularly in an environment where the community is growing and where expectations are putting a lot more pressure on the community as a whole, but it also potentially puts great pressure on you. Just by way of contrast, two weeks ago I came back from walking the Kokoda track again in New Guinea. It's the third time I've done it. This time I took my 38-year-old daughter who has a pacemaker and two girls. Michael Bonney came on that trip with me. The beauty about that trip to me is partly the history of the battles that were fought there, the beauty of the environment which is untouched, the physical challenge but then, every so often, running into what I call the indigenous community of Papua New Guinea. They're, they live in villages, unlike our indigenous people who are fundamentally nomads. They have no cars, they have no television, they have no phones, they have no alcohol. They live very, very simple lives. They take great pride in the cleanliness of their village and what they have and their education program 
But I can assure you, there is no unhappiness. There's no depression. These children are bubbling, their parents are bubbling with enthusiasm and the joy of life. And as I was flying back, I was reminded again, in my work beyond blue, in your work now and in the future, you are dealing with people who are ill, physically, which often is understandable, but also mentally. And you've got to ask yourself why it is, as we try and dress ourselves, as we try and get bigger, bigger cars and bigger houses, that we allow expectation to cause us so much internal pain, stress and anxiety, which if untreated can often result in a very serious clinical depression. Of course, with the more serious forms of depression, mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, you can't cure it, with medication you can manage it. A lot of emotional depression can also lead, sadly, to death. We started Beyond Blue in 1997 when my daughter, who was at university like you, drove up from Geelong, crying her eyes out, two of her male friends had, in totally unrelated accidents that week, died on the road. And she said to me, Dad, what can you do to stop these young men dying on the roads? And I thought she was talking about the road toll. But when I had these two deaths examined more closely, I found out both men had been left with a, by their female partners, one engaged, to then pursue careers in metropolitan Melbourne which were not available in the Western District. Totally within their rights, these young men were emotionally upset, emotionally depressed, they turned to alcohol, they used their car to take their lives. They were suicides. Yesterday the figures for suicide in this country were made public for 2012. The rate has gone up a little bit to 2,535 from 2,400. Every year, about 62,000 people attempt to take their lives, which is two-thirds of the NCG full. Now imagine sitting in the NCG and looking around you, two-thirds of the people in a full stadium would be attempting to take their lives. It's why your role, your profession is so terribly important. But it's no good if you're not healthy, if you're not fit, if you're not able to discharge your duties to your potential clients and patients in the future unless you understand what's happening to yourself and unless you can get a balance in your life. So in the few minutes left I want to try and give you answer that question up there how do you deal with stress? How many of you when you woke up this morning gave thanks just for waking up? Apart from me too. You were sucking on that sweet before, surprise me. Uh, what, does that what, it, what do you think that tells you about yourself? Anything? Probably that you're young, understandable, your whole future's in front of you, understandable. But does it not send out a message that you might be a little complacent about the most valuable gift we have, which is the gift of life? We don't know how long we're going to be here. I could walk out here tonight and drop dead. I might live to 150, unlikely, but I might. So the gift of life is terribly important. But none of you think enough about it when you wake up every morning just to say thank you, to understand you've got another 24 hours. When I wake up in the morning, and I've been doing it for 20 years, so it's not just as I've been getting older, it's like Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture and the cannons are firing at the end of it. I realise I'm still alive and I give thanks knowing I've got another 24 hours. Now think about it. There's another important element in this because it answers that question. My gift of life for me is my rock. My rock is the thing in which I can then weigh the things that cause me stress and anxiety in a day. So if you say, my rock, gift of life, the most important thing I've got <coughs> On a scale of north to ten. Alright? So I lost an election a few years ago. In 1999. I was a little surprised I lost. But compared to the gift of life, how did it rank? Well, to be quite honest, it was only a one or a two. It was part of a natural process. No one had been hurt. No one died. I was still able to get up the next morning. So instead of collapsing into a heap, and woeing the people of Victoria for voting me out of office, I said, well, this is just life. People lose their jobs every day of the week. What am I excited about? A one or a two. 
It meant that I could deal with that issue without going to bed that night terribly upset, not dealing with it and allowing it to develop into a very major depressive illness. My parents died a few years ago. They're both in their 80s. I was sad to see them go, obviously. But they died in the natural order of things. They both had full lives. Again, against my rock, two or three. If one of my children were to predecease me, it would be an eleven. So do you understand where I'm coming from? You've got to be able to have a system, develop a discipline, that allows you every day to deal with the things that cause you anxiety and stress. Now before I go to bed, oh sorry, when I go to bed every night, before I go to sleep, for just a part of a second, I review the day. The things that I've done reasonably well or well, I wash out very quickly. The things I've done less well or totally fouled up, I focus on. And it's been known from time to time that I've upset some people. Don't know why, but it has. I then try and deal with that so that I can sleep well. Because as you medical students would know, the value of a good night's sleep so the way in which you feel and conduct yourself the next day is terribly, terribly important. If you carry issues from one day to the next, so often they can continue to fester to a point in which you become seriously clinically depressed. So you need to develop a mechanism now, if you haven't already, for dealing with life, for dealing with change within life. I suppose you're a bit like me in one sense. When I was growing up, neither my parents nor my educators <coughs> taught me anything about change. I learned about how to spell and speak and write and clean my shoes, but no one talked to me about change. Now why is that important? Because in this day and age, people are being confronted with change more often than ever before. Sometimes that change is imposed on us. You lose your job. You get lose an election. You get delisted if you're a footballer. Some will be able to talk to you about it. You've got to be able to deal with change. Some change we bring on ourselves. We elect to change jobs, etc. My father probably only had three jobs in his life. I've probably had 30 already. And I hope to have a lot more. Think about change. You should see change as an opportunity, whether it's forced on you or whether you undertake it yourself. Learn from the past but don't look back wanting to re-harness what you've lost or what's been taken away from you. Door closes, so I lost the election in 99, I made the decision, alright, I'd had 23 good years in Parliament, I'd had wonderful seven years as Premier, people wanted something else, that's fine, close the door, move on. Never regret my period in Parliament, never want to go back there. Move on. Now, as young medical students, it is probably in one sense more stressful for you than many other professions. It's the quantity of work. It's the way in which you're treated by your seniors and we keep trying to change that, don't get me wrong. It's the way in which you have expectations of yourself to pass, to do well. It's the expectations your parents might have with you, or your lecturers. I know we all want to succeed but so-called success is not always the key to happiness. And the hard thing to do when you're young is getting the balance right, because you're desperately striving to prove yourself, to yourself and to others. But I can assure you there's a lot more in life than that. When I look at those young Papuans, and then I look at the young man who came and saw me earlier this week, who was also a very well-known footballer, who is suicidal, tried to take his life three or four times, I say to myself, why is it in such a lucky country like Australia we have so much depression, so much unhappiness, so higher levels of suicide? So you have embarked by choice on a career which is terribly fulfilling and terribly demanding. But I'd like to stress, based on the survey figures that we've come up with, or been dictated to us by your own seniors in the profession, there's a lot of unhappiness out there. And there's a lot of stress and there's a high level of suicide. The suicide level among male doctors is twice the national male average. The suicide rate among female doctors is six times the female rate in the population. 
So it's tough. It's a great industry. It's a great and highly respected profession. But your first responsibility is to look after your own health. And that should apply to all of us in life. You can't do your jobs as doctors unless you are yourself physically and mentally fit. And if you allow yourself to be consumed by things around you, then your lack of professionalism, your lack of wellness, is going to be reflected in those you're trying to treat. And there are still today some doctors when people go in and see them and say, I think I'm suffering from depression. The doctors fundamentally throw them out of the clinic. They don't know. They're not educated about depression and mental health. They can't handle it, in many cases, because they're ill themselves. So, I leave you tonight, please, with two or three thoughts. Firstly, start appreciating the gift of life that you're currently enjoying. There's no guarantee how, you're going to be, how long you're going to be here. And every morning when you wake up, just give thanks for the opportunity to have what you have, to be able to breathe the air and make choices. Secondly, from that I would ask you to think about what discipline you have in place to manage your life. Not just as medical students and perhaps doctors and specialists etc. in a later life, but what disciplines do you have for managing life and change itself? Because if you develop such a system, it's good for you as students, it's good for you as individuals, it'll be good for you as parents, etc., etc. So, gift of life, develop your rock. And then thirdly, please, discipline a way of dealing with the issues that you confront every day. Don't allow them to build up. If you have a disagreement with a mate, have the disagreement, go around the next day, make the effort to make up. There's no value. Life is too short to keep it going. And the last thing I would say is this. Uh, you know better than most the value of good health. And that means you've got to maintain healthy lifestyles. It means you've got to stay physically fit and mentally fit. It means you do so because of the completeness of living it will give you and the example you will set for others by example rather than instruction. What's the point of having an obese Jeff Kenneth come to your office and you being the obese doctor says to me I'm overweight and go and lose weight when he's bursting out of his bloody shirt? Not at all. You have such an opportunity because you're seeing people every day to be optimistic, to be helping them mentally deal with the things that they're on about, not to be long in the tooth, not to be pessimistic, to be honest with them, but also to give them confidence in what you're doing. But it comes about from your own good health. So this is an important seminar at this stage of your studies. Because as I say, the record, the research from your own peers is pretty bloody frightening. And I wouldn't want, although there are many of you who probably suffer depression or anxiety or stress, we don't want that number to get worse. <coughs> Government's not going to fix it for you. Our health, our mental health, is something that we can control and we dictate. It's our responsibility. Don't blame other people if you're not healthy. Having said all of that, I don't want you to think in any way that I'm pessimistic about the future, or even your profession. I'm not. I'm very optimistic. I love life. I love every day I live. But more importantly, there are some issues we've got to face, and we've got to do it individually, and we've got to do it collectively. And I hope today I've given you something to take away in terms of the value of your life, the value of developing a rock, the need, importantly, to think about what you've done during the day so you can sleep well, and then finally your own physical and mental well-being. Have a great night. Go ahead. <laughs>
in teaching, particularly in fourth year and fifth year, but I also do guest appearances in various other time slots, in various other year slots. So I've been teaching for quite some time now. I also actively practice psychiatry. I have a clinic, <coughs> which is a women's mental health clinic, but I also see other um, patients in private, um, a small amount of private practice. Most of my time is in research and uh, teaching. Unfortunately, I do see medical students and other students who have uh, significant mental illness. And uh, I have to say that that has become increased demand in the last few years. And it is always very difficult to see uh, members of my profession um, coming in with particular disorders. So what I would love to do is to try and promote a sense of your understanding about mental illness and what you can do to actually help yourselves. The other thing that I've been working with some of the numerous people and I'm really delighted that there's so much interest in the whole area um, and also I look forward to working with um, AMSA as well. But we want to put forward and uh, work up workshops for the more junior medical students but to invite anyone who's interested as um, early as first year to get a bit more clinical information and knowledge. So we, we, we are working towards running probably a one-day workshop, maybe you'll run it twice a year or three times a year, and specifically look at um, mental health issues. There is a mental health first aid course that's, that's run, and between you and me, it's crap. It is not for you guys. Um, it is for Joe Blow in the street who's never, ever heard of mental disorders, whereas we hope that for you, who are budding uh, health practitioners and um, or in the science area that um, you deserve and require a lot more clinically focused information. So that's what the gap is that we want to take up. Um, and uh, we realise that's a gap in the, in the faculty and I'm talking to people in the faculty to see if we can close that gap in the syllabus itself. But that's a whole other story. So uh, just to bring this all up to the same uh, start point, um, what I want to do is just briefly give you some data on, on um, depression. Is it possible to get it on the screen here? Because it's just really tricky to sort of keep turning around. But the morbidity of depression is, is quite considerable in that um, it is comparable to angina and advanced coronary artery disease. Depression has a high mortality, as you've heard on many occasions, and the incidence of depression is actually increasing. It's anticipated and has extended and has actually achieved that goal of becoming the biggest burden in health um, around the world. It's not just um, in this country, but it is the biggest burden of health around the world. One in six Australians currently is prescribed um, antidepressants at some stage of their lives. 15%, 19% uh, of women and 15% of men have been uh, prescribed antidepressants and um, there are more prescriptions as people get older. The figure that Jeff Kennett talked about in terms of suicidality for men and women is, um, is a sobering statistic and I do have some more statistics to present to you. But one of the other things that is lesser known is the single biggest successful or completed suicide demographic is 52 to 55 year old women as a single age demographic. That's not very well known and um, is of great concern for everyone as well. And that's a trend that has been picked up in more recent times. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'll swap over to here. Um, just to bring us all up to the same start point, don't panic, I'm not going to go off into neurotransmitter land and um, neurocircuitry. We do when you're in fourth year, but this is not, not for tonight's presentation. So we talk about six symptoms uh, clusters. You may have heard old categorization of biological versus reactive depression and so on. That's really ancient thinking. Think of it this way because it helps you clinically understand the, con the mood symptoms. There are mood symptoms which are sadness and lack of pleasure and irritability. There are vegetative symptoms which are sleep, appetite, weight and sexual drive difficulties. There is cognitive symptoms, which is attention, memory, negative distortions regarding self and the world and the future. This is the I'm no good, I'm absolutely hopeless, everybody knows it, there's no point going on because the world is just a terrible place, there is no future. 
So the negative distortions, obviously, as the word distortion is in there, this is not reality at all and not based on particular incidents that the person may have experienced. Impulse control is uh, another key area with suicide and homicide being symptoms of depression. We, we get better in psychiatry as uh, we ask a lot about suicide, but we don't tend to ask a lot about homicide. And so every now and again, there's some horrendous accident, uh, some horrendous incident that happens that, that causes us to, to actually look again. Behavioural uh, symptoms, which include lack of motivation, lack of interest, and tiredness as well. There are physical symptoms which are uh, preoccupation with physical, physical illness, with headaches, stomach aches, muscle pain, constipation and movement retardation. So these are the six clusters of depressive symptomatology. And as you can see, there's quite a wide variation in the sorts of symptoms that people experience. Now, depression as an illness is on a spectrum. So it can be that people experience some mild of... Uh, cluster of symptoms, but that they're still functioning and they're still coping right through to an actual severe uh, constellation of all of these symptoms. So I'm going to expand a little bit on what Jeff talked about, which is the National Mental Health Survey of Doctors and Medical Students. Now, it was um, basically funded by Beyond Blue as part of the Beyond Blue Doctors Mental Health Program. And um, there's a very august body advisory committee that, uh, that actually oversaw that survey, so it was put together very nicely. And um, Mukesh Heikerwell was, in fact, chairing that committee. They wanted to understand the issues associated with mental health of Australian medical students and doctors, to increase the awareness across the medical profession and broader community of issues associated with mental health of medical students and doctors, as well as to inform the development of mental health services and supports for the medical profession. They're the aims. I won't go through all of this, but the bottom part is important, which is the sample size was 42,942 doctors and 6,658 medical students. And as Jeff has mentioned, there was a very high response rate, um, which is much higher than you would normally see for any sort of questionnaires. So what did the medical students report? Basically, they reported higher rates of general distress and specific mental health diagnoses. The rates of depression and anxiety were similar to those reported for other Australian university students. In this faculty, we do note that um, students in the Bachelor of Biomedical Science course and other courses that are related um, to the medical course uh, also um, have students with very, very high levels of uh, depressive and anxiety disorders. So um, the issues that people face is generally uh, across the board in, in terms of the health professional type of uh, students, but it, there is still a significant problem for medical students. Female students, and again, remembering my speciality is women's mental health, um, had higher levels of psychological distress and reported more specific mental health diagnoses than, than male students. Female students were more likely than male students to be classified as having a high likelihood of a psychiatric disorder with very high levels. So that's 47.2% of the female student population versus 35.9% of the male student population. 47.2% is getting up to 50%. That's, that's really significantly distressing. Because I'm an academic, I can't help but put in graphs. And um, you see the medical student uh, male is the, the blue bar, yellow is the female bar, and the, this is current diagnosis of depression, current diagnosis of anxiety, attempted suicide by gender. So you can see the difference between the female, the female medical students and the, the female general population. But I think more disturbing is the difference between the medical students and the other professionals. That's, that's more the benchmark that, that we'd be looking at. So again, we do see this, this is a, an ongoing problem. Young doctors and female doctors appear to have high levels of general and specific mental health problems, and they de definitely reported greater work stress. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that. So this is again showing you the doctors in the population and 6.6 um, the ratio the percentage of female doctors compared to 3.4% of the general female population had um, high levels of psychological distress and that's much higher than the other professional group. Suicidal ideation by doctors and by gender 
is 28.5% in female doctors and again compared to 12.1% in female other professional and 15% of women in the general community. 22.3% of male doctors um, had suicidal ideation. This, con this, this issue about depression in medical school is not just here. Um, certainly in the US the uh, there is a lot of, of work going on looking at the mental health of uh, medical school um, students and, and graduates as well. Um, so here's a couple of papers that particularly look at depression, stigma and suicidal ideation and a lot of the topics that, that have been talked about have been raised um, here and elsewhere as well. I won't bother about that. Why is it that medical students, and you've got to forgive me, but I've got to put, I've got to put the, the various medical TV shows in that we all look at, but why is it that, that medical students experience more depression? Well, having a look at this from, from our um, clinical perspective, students start medical school with the same rate of depression as in the general community. It's not that there is a specifically, um, that we love depressed people and we tell them to come in and do medicine. It's not that. Um, so we're assuming the genetic familial etiologies are the same. But then you see this increased rate of depression over successive years of the course. So clearly there is something going on in the course and the whole um, educational process and the conceptual ideas about becoming a doctor that is part of the special factors that are contributing to this. So what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing people getting burnt out getting into medical school so that um, there's a lot of pressure obviously to get that incredibly high um, TER score and to get you know the various high scores that are required on some of the most ridiculous testing and processes that that people are subjected to getting in um, you know some of the some of the tests that are done particularly some of the craziness of the matching the shapes and doing all the other crap that we, you have to do to get in, which, you know, we, we shake our heads thinking, who came up with this? Of what use is it for us in a health profession when you're facing a patient and you have to talk to this person about their life and death, that you've been fantastic at rotating shapes? It's just not good. There is an added burnout in people, um, as I mentioned, you know, the feeder courses now for the medical school. Bachelor of Biomedical Science is a great example, but there are other courses as well. There are people who have to do a science degree and then an honours degree and then they do a GAMSAT and then they might have worked in something. And um, by the time these people are getting into medical school, they're bloody exhausted. And it has been a very tough road all the way along because all the time they're told, well, you've got to have a fantastic GPA, you've got to be in the top you know, percentage of this and that and the other thing. Um, we've experienced some issues with um, people getting into the, uh, the Gippsland campus when they came from uh, non-science, non-neuroscience, uh, non, I'm sorry, medical science type background. So um, some people who, who were actually came in from uh, criminology, law, drama, all sorts of other background. Fantastic in, in that they did really, really well in those fields, but they had no, no science background whatsoever. Did um, really well on the GAM set, so they obviously had to study hard to do that, but then have sort of crashed and burned because all of a sudden, it, you know, like the pressure of suddenly having to do heaps of biochemistry, um, physiology, all sorts of things in the preclinical years has been just awful. The other thing we know about is the pressure of the two of the two years combined into one year. That's with the special entry course. The, the first years who came in with the high TER scores, we know that a number of people got into their the medical school because their parents wanted them to. Every year we have a number of students who got a hugely high score and they're doing medicine because that's what their parents said they had to do. That also they did the Asian five in VCE because their parents told them to. And this is another pressure because when it comes to putting in the hard yards and having that dedication to actually be interested in people is what you want to see in your doctor. 
And if that's not your bag, if you are a budding physicist, if you are a phenomenally gifted mathematician, what the hell are you doing in medical school? And sometimes we, you know, we really tear our hair out when you, when you sit on some of the panels, um, which I haven't done recently, but when you sit on some of the panels for the interviews and you see these kids come who have got, you are absolutely geniuses in other fields. And yet, when you dig a bit deeper, it's because their cultural expectations, their parent expectations, their peer group expectations is, you got 99.9, .9, of course you're going to do medicine. Not, not true. These are the kids who also then get highly stressed because you can imagine, if you have that particular genius type brain in those areas, to be confronted with the sort of ambiguity of clinical practice, to be confronted with the sorts of things that you've got to do to be a good doctor, means that you flounder and you're not used to floundering. You're used to being the person who can just snap their fingers and those equations and everything else comes to the fingertips. So this is another issue. So I would urge people who are here because of their peer pressure or family pressure or whatever, see if you can work your way around this. Make a decision that suits you. Because if you don't, if you are doing this for somebody else, you will fall over. It will not be a pleasant experience. It will be a chore from the day one. The volume of work, um, sorry, increased competition in a high achieving group. Um, because of the internship situation, we know that, for example, um, a couple of years ago, or was it? Yeah, a couple of years ago when there was this massive stampede of medical students who'd finished the course because Melbourne Uni graduates for the first time of their, their particular um, model came online and they were all out there. Monash had both the uh, direct entry students and then the first lot of the uh, lateral entry students. Everybody sort of came to, an, to the end and the internship positions were, were fewer and that pressure was just enormous. So you have already got a high pressure system with the, with the competitive group that's in medical school and then all of a sudden there was this rumour that went around about you won't get internships, you won't, you won't be able to then practice. Now a lot of that I hope has dissipated because there are lots of plans and lots of positions that are opening up for interns. It's not as if there's not work out there, there's a lot of work out there um, and so the hospital systems are now you know, re-geared to actually look at this. There is still um, the competition that's there because of course people say well okay I got an internship but it was at the Ayers Rock Base Hospital that's not really going to get me very far um, but there is uh, I hope a lessening of that particular um, concern but it is a highly competitive um, process and unfortunately that adds to the stress the volume of work is enormous we recognize that and of course the problem is that you're taught by experts in every different area and every single area thinks that their stuff is the most important and so they will give you increasing amounts of, of the volume of work. That leads to isolation because there is this pressure to perform, there is also a pressure to get everything in and get, every, get an HD or get a D on everything and that means that you're not um, you're not able to socialise uh, or that you are actually isolating yourself from family and friends. The ward round situation has come up a few times um, in the questions that were, were given to Jeff Kennett and I have to say that it is slower to change in some areas but more rapid to change in others and um, certainly when I was a, a, a resident it was quite routine, or when I was a student and then a resident, it was quite routine for the tutorials to begin with. Tell me the 12 causes of, um, uh, no, well, tell me the 12 causes of raised intracranial pressure. And if you got to number eight and then went blank on the next four, the tutor would say, well, what kind of idiot are you? How stupid are you? And, and all this sort of stuff would go on. Um, and we noticed that you know a lot of people wouldn't turn up to tutorials and so on because it was a sort of sense of anxiety um, that was really prevalent. Now, hopefully, that kind of um, direct humiliation is is not happening, um, and some hospitals are more enlightened than others. What we still see, though, is that in the um, less psychologically minded specialties, that there is still a sense of that kind of high pressure, um, give me the answers right now, I want you to be here as, as long as I am, and so on and so on. Um, 
the AMA and the medical um, workforce laws, rules, have also meant that the, um, the sorts of things that young interns and, and JRMOs experience is better because there is a strict number of hours that you have to have off between one shift and the next and hopefully that will also then engender some of the sort of more respectful practices that we see. Um, I certainly think that in, in the areas of general medicine and in, obviously in psychiatry that there is a much greater um, acceptance or bringing in of medical students as part of the team. This is one of the things that in medicine of the mind, which was the course, which is the course of um, teaching psychiatry clinical that Rob Seltzer and I put together in, uh, a long time ago now and has been running from year four. Medicine of the mind is about saying that students are part of the medical treatment team. And that's the sort of uh, general ethos that we're trying to engender. Some places are better than others. Um, there are always avenues of complaint that one can make, but I realise that the power um, balance is a difficult one if you want to have a career in a particular teaching hospital in a particular specialty then it's difficult to make complaints but there are mentors around that we hope we keep increasing the mentorship systems and so on not perfect yet but at least acknowledged and it, it is getting better the volume of work and the isolation I've mentioned sorry oh, that's a repeat slide now what are the other factors Jeff Kennett in his um, homespun way talked about some very important things which was poor sleep. Poor sleep is an absolute killer and um, along with poor sleep which we're seeing a lot of is the Red Bull um, and other Guarana packed um, mother drinks. Now I've got to tell you that um, this is a dreadful way to treat your brain that we all know that as students we all cram and we all try and get that last minute um, bit of information in there but as a neuroscientist I can tell you that what you're doing to your brain in terms of short-term memory and also laying down new learning circuits and brain um, circuits for remembering important information is killing that by poor sleep and using the high energy drinks. I'll never forget in an OSCE situation where we had a student who couldn't sit down at all and was just leaping around the whole time in the room and he was not able to concentrate on the tasks. So when you're in an exam situation, your capacity to concentrate and to focus is paramount, particularly in an oral exam situation, which you will have a lot of in your course, as you know. If you cannot concentrate, if you cannot pick up the questions that your examiner is firing at you in the exam situation, if you can't take a top of the mountain view of the question and the situ clinical situation, then, then that is, is bad. That is going to give you a poor mark or a fail. And something like a short-term energy drink, hyping yourself up on caffeine, is a surefire way to kill the concentration and the short-term, sorry, the more intermediate memory circuits. So don't do it. All right? You need to be able to function and be able to have the longer term memory. So hyper use of caffeine is not a substitute for sleep, nor is it a substitute for eating, uh, nor is eating junk food a good idea in terms of your brain and your general health. Don't forget, you, you know, you need to actually have decent nutrition in order to be able to learn and to function. So it's not just about the, I don't want to get diabetes and hypertension when I get older, but it's also about your brain function. So we see many people, and I, again, in the Women's Mental Health Clinic, very interesting, I see a number of women who go on the most crazy of diets and, you know, sort of on one lettuce leaf and um, a whole bunch of Coke Zero are um, trying to function and wonder why they're depressed. And one of the things we start saying is, okay, could you get some more actual fuel into your brain because you will find that that will make a difference. And it's really interesting. Some of these simple things can make a huge difference. Um, the, the vitamin industry exists because of people who want to lose weight and have the lettuce leaf and Coke Zero diet. But the vitamin industry that is not going to just taking a whole bunch of vitamins plus lettuce 
and Coke Zero is also not good for your brain. So you do need to have a reasonable diet and that actually means reasonable. You know, I mean, it's very easy if you're studying really hard, if you're running in and out of lectures and shoots and so on, that you just grab a Big Mac here and there, um, that you have lots of high fatty foods and so on. But in terms of brain nutrition, do it properly because otherwise depression is one of the, the things that is related to poor to poor nutrition. Similarly with um, poor uh, sleep also it's an ongoing stimulant for depression. Alcohol and drugs. Now I'm not just an old fogey, I've been where you are and well I am an old fogey but I was where you were and I can tell you that um, it's of great concern to us the alcohol and drug consumption in medical students. One of the things that's really, really scary, and for those people who are at the Alfred, uh, who went to the Grand Round this week, but you will have heard about the designer drugs. Um, on the streets of, of St Kilda and other places in Melbourne and on this campus um, is a whole synthetic ice and other amphetamine industry. And um, this is absolutely terrifying because people are using these drugs as the sort of next step on to where the Red Bull etc didn't work, I've got to stay up, I've got to absorb all this stuff and so we have a number of students who then um, get hooked on and use a number of the designer drugs. So um, the push of amphetamines of people into acute psychotic episodes and ongoing chronic psychotic illness is high. There is a high correlation between the use of the ice and other analog drugs and schizophrenia. There is also a very high link between cannabis use and poor cognitive function as well as schizophrenia. That's because, and I'll give you all this in your fourth year lectures, but that's because cannabis has a particular, THC has a particular effect on the dopaminergic systems in that it upregulates dopaminergic systems and upregulated dopaminergic systems is what creates psychotic symptoms. So when people go cannabis is safe, it's relaxing, it is not in some people who have a predisposition to developing a psychotic illness but don't know it. We can't pinpoint who out of all of you have the genetic predisposition to develop a psychotic illness. It's not a straightforward genetic heritab heritability. So it's not like saying, oh, I don't have any relatives that have um, schizophrenia in my family. But it is playing Russian roulette with your brain. And your brain is your tool of the trade. Now that's what you want to use for the rest of your career. You're, you know, you're not going to be um, in a career where it's all about your muscle strength and so on, but it's your brain. So if you are doing a lot of alcohol and drugs, stop now because it is going to kill your future career. And I know that everyone thinks it's cool, it's the thing to do to be drunk and to be, you know, like conversations about what did you do on the weekend? Well, I got off my face. You know, it, it's, it's like, okay, and the value in that was, and it's, it's, just, it's just the culture that we have gotten ourselves into. I don't know why it's the, it's the way that we think we should be enjoying life. I mean, I, I was on a, an unfortunate flight. I, I'm often on several unfortunate flights, but not necessarily Malaysian Airlines, um, where I... Um, <laughs> I have another Malaysian Airlines story, but anyway, I was on a I was on a flight which was um, going to LA, and it was Virgin Airlines, and the same flight was then um, going to Vegas, and so it was known. I didn't know this. It was known as the party flight, and it was the most horrendous situation where you know every second person was getting drunk, and um, it was all about the prelude. And then coming back on a similar flight, every second person had lost teeth or had a plaster cast. And it was about, and these are Australian, young Australians, and it's got to this point where unless you can't remember what you did, you didn't have a good time. And that's a crazy state of affairs. You know, how, and how many times is it that we reward people after the med ball or whatever else, you know, um, Oh, I, I, you know, got off my face. I had this. I had that. I had the other thing. And everyone goes, "Oh, yeah, that's great, man." <laughs> you know, it's just, and, and it's just when you stand back and you look at that, and you just think, you know, this is ridiculous. 
why do we think it's cool to, you know, oh, I threw up three times and, you know, I don't remember where I ended up the next day. Why are we actually saying that that kind of behaviour is cool and to be looked up to? It doesn't make any sense when you think about it. You really, you know, and then and then the sort of the, the women that I have to see and they go, oh, I, I don't know, I, you know, somebody, somebody slept with me, I've got no idea. Um, you know, it's just all of this stuff that happens as a result of disinhibited behaviour, which we shouldn't be rewarding. We should actually be going, well, you're an idiot. You know, what kind of fool are you that you've put your brain at this great toxic ri li risk? And I could talk to you till the cows come home about the number of neurons that you destroy and the number of circuits that you destroy. And it's those circuits and neurons you need when you front up to me in the OSCEs to answer my piercing questions. Okay, it's the pack effect. Don't get into the medical student pack effect. It is not cool to be continually spaced out or bombed out or all those things. The other issue is the romantic relationships between students, which can be really rewarding, but when they go wrong, they can be really depressing. And we have this situation often where you have people who attempt suicide in the context of a relationship breakup. And this is where it's like, you know, <laughs> You're 18 years old or 19 years old and the context for that person is that they don't know a whole lot else about life because they haven't had a whole lot of other life. And so the, the breakup of a relationship can have this profound effect and it's, it's again this issue of the depression that people can experience as a result of that a very, very sharp depression. And so again, um, when we talk about the pack effect, it's really important that it's not about the sort of humiliation of people in your groups about the relationship side of things. Disillusionment with career I've touched on. And again, I'll say, don't do medicine to please your parents or the next door neighbor or whoever it is. Disempowerment in the hospital system is something that medical students do describe and um, bullying in the teaching clinical system again um, and I think it's, it's, it's the sort of leering look on the guy's face as he's looking at the female student again is, is, a, is a whole area that we are tackling but be aware of that. You have got capacity to report bullying and particular um, you know, the humiliation sort of behaviours. And if not you reporting it, then other people in your group report it. You know, this is where it is useful to function as a, as a set rather than as a one person. There is a pressure to proceed, to get the uh, elite jobs and, and so on. Financial concerns as a student is the other issue that uh, many people are facing, particularly if they're paying, um, if they're international students and so on, so where there's a high fee expectation. But we do know that a number of medical students face financial issues. And we also worry about some of the prostitution that some students have resorted to in order to make money because of the obvious health and other aspect, aspects that um, have happened. So again, um, good financial advice or other sorts of support mechanisms are really important. What are the factors that cause depression in the medical students continued? Contact with dying and disabled patients can be really awful. And again, it depends on whether you are um, a sensitive soul and, and you are not going to use um, awful coping mechanisms. And by that I mean either using alcohol and drugs or um, becoming macho and sort of laughing about the, the poor sensitive student who really struggled with seeing somebody who was in a very disabled condition or whether you just you know become so blasé about it that, that you don't think about it twice. Those sorts of things are the bad mechanisms. It is important if you do have contact with dying and disabled patients and you are finding yourself ruminating about it or you're finding yourself feeling terribly sad about what you've seen or that you start avoiding that you talk to um, either your course, the, the, the particular tutors that are involved in that, in that area, or you talk to a senior, or you talk to a registrar, um, or that you avail yourself of student services. There are a number of different avenues, and I think we're talking about areas of help.
that um, are available at the end of this. But contact with dying and disabled patients. If you experience something when you are seeing these patients, then you are actually... That's, that's not a bad thing in that it doesn't mean that medicine should make you a blasé, couldn't care less about what I'm seeing. It's about then how do you deal with that is really important. You know, we want you to be compassionate people and we want you to be able to put yourself in the patient's shoes because then you'll provide good care, but then you have to be able to get out of that as well so that you then have some objectivity and you learn that over time. Being unsure of the professional role, and um, sometimes people say, "Well, you know, as a medical student, I'm the, the last of the, at the bottom of the barrel. Um, you know, the, the senior nurses love bossing me around and not letting me see patients and so on." Again, that's where tutors and the groups can actually be very useful. Over identification with patients is the other side of not of being over compassionate, and again, you need to develop your own capacities and tools to be able to talk about the case with a colleague um, and to say, you know, this has reminded me of when my grandmother was dying, or this is this has brought up memories for me of something else, or or whatever it is. Know yourself as much as you can. Understand what you have been through? What are the difficult things that you've been through? Because then you can be a bit more forewarned if you're, if you're facing that kind of issue. Now, somebody mentioned the problem of management of depression in med students. The stigma is high, and we do know the number of people cover up symptoms leading to late diagnosis. Um, for every one of the doctors that, that in, ends up being considered to be um, unable to carry out her or his profession, there'd be at least three times as many who are receiving treatment and who um, are not reported to the medical board because in the view of the treating doctors um, that that person has got a depression but they're still able to carry out their particular illness, so uh, their particular um, work. So don't forget that that people can actually have isolated depressive aspects. It doesn't all necessarily blur across, and that can make it difficult to treat and difficult to pick, but it also means that you know, there is capacity to treat somebody while they're actually continuing to function. The difficulties become when there is impaired judgment in the doctor, and that's when we have to make a decision about if the do doctor has impaired judgment, that that's when they become a risk. Okay, so that's different to experiencing a mental disorder like depression or anxiety. The um, adverse impact of the diagnosis on the future is still something that many medical students um, fear, and future job prospects in particular is something that medical students find difficult to seek help because of that. Now, all care is given when we are involved, and I mean we as in now speaking in my clinical hat, to make sure that there's confidentiality, to make sure that there is um, people involved with the treatment who are not directly involved with the teaching, etc., etc. So there is a lot of thought given to this, and the services that are available are bound by confidentiality. So I think we've got a lot better with actually providing that safe haven of treatment but it is still about decreasing the stigma, and the stigma from the medical profession itself is still a problem. It's actually that people with depression are better accepted in other, in other fields, um, and we still have to work on that. If I drummed home the drugs and alcohol message any further, um, but that is one of the things that, that people prefer to self-medicate with alcohol and illicit drugs, especially the amphetamines, for depression. That's a common... Um, scenario. And the other, the other thing is um, a lot of drugs are available on the internet. So it's no longer the issue that people have to go and front up the seedy man in the raincoat uh, on St Kil in St Kilda Dark, Dark Alley. They can just pr go online and get various designer drugs. So we are very concerned about the self-medication and the I'm using this to cope with stress. I need to work all night and not sleep and keep doing that. So that is a really bad trap to fall into. Self-medication with samples, this happens a lot in junior doctors and, and if you stand back and look at it, it's terrible practice that somebody goes, I've, I've recognised that I'm depressed, oh look there's some um, samples of, of Prozac over there, I think I'll just you know, grab some and see how I go. Pseudo-treatment um, by, by GP in that um, the, the, the junior doctor will not actually allow the GP to treat the whole condition 
they'll sort of bully the the GP into just give me just give me something you know look I've got to get back to work and do stuff so that can be an issue as well issue with compliance with psychotherapy is being thought to be too time consuming it's too slow it's too woolly it's non-medical I know more than the psychotherapist etc the grandiosity we're all pretty grandiose when it comes down to us and uh, and that can be difficult the medical students and doctors can be very difficult to treat because again we get into this sense of oh, I know what I know this I you know I, I know all about this so I'm not going to actually put myself in the patient role and that can be another whole issue hiding depression we've talked about um, and patient care affected by depression um, because of the fear of the registration all right there are lots of therapeutic modalities for depression and the other thing about um, the increasing interest in psychiatry is we are seeing an increase in the number of medical students who are interested in psychiatry doing the selectives electives and some other things this is an example um, but we're also seeing an increase in psych registrars so that there's a lot more interest in becoming trainee psychiatrists and I think that's because the field is also moving away from some of the more traditional um, very sort of airy fairy approaches to various mental illnesses and we have got a lot further with some of the newer treatments for depression and with some of the neuroscience translation into the actual field so pharmacotherapy psychotherapies um, are combined we use uh, pharmacogenetics to determine what's the best antidepressant to be used um, there's magnetic stimulation treatment and various other magnetic uh, brain stimulation treatments that we undertake at MAPRC. There is, when I say light, I don't mean as in not heavy treatment, but I mean as in with blue light treatments and so on. Diet and exercise are important strategies in treatment. Now, I've got a whole lot on women and depression, but I'm just going to cut to the chase, which we know about, is the hormone impact in depression. And this is something I want that slide is just there for the women in the room um, be careful with oral contraceptives and I've got a whole lot of lecture um, on the hormones and and depression oral contraceptives many combined oral contraceptives are depressogenic it is not well known out there but it is an area of work that we've been working on and there is an insidious subclinical depression that women can experience so if you do have the issue of insidious depression and a subclinical depression so not the moribund neurovegetative type of depression but something that comes on insidiously with irritability hostility um, decreased libido can't um, enjoy life to the way you used to think about whether there's been a change in the pill or use of the pill absolutely stay away from implanon depoprovera and the progesterone only contraceptives they are bad bad news for depression um, and it's because I, know I haven't got time to go into the psychoneuroendocrine aspects of it but there is a lot of information that we have about that the best type of pill in terms of depressive outcomes is probably Zoli um, which is one of the newer pills um, Diane and Juliet and that group also have a relatively sensitive um, progesterone but the commonest form of the pill Levelin has a very high percentage of or the type of progesterone which creates uh, depressive uh, responses in people who are sensitive to the hormonal aspect that's not everyone but there are some women again who are predisposed to PMDD so premenstrual dysphoric disorder or depression related to the pill um, and that's my big advice um, on that so overall suggestions watch out for each other challenge the macho culture wherever you see it if it's in bullying and war drowns or if it's macho culture in your own groups challenge that you know you don't have to be nasty to each other in order to get to where you want to get to you don't have to climb over each other's dead bodies in order to get the job that you want okay and that that has to get out of the thinking within medical school also don't put up with macho rubbish in hospital situations as a group you can be very powerful people are aware of litigious issues and occupational health and safety and respect and all these other things that you become part of a workforce when you're a student in the hospital so if you have this issue then take take solace in your groups you are in in a group you're in this huge group but you're also in subgroups and use the group if anyone does have suicidal um, comments or makes suicidal comments 
if they make comments like, I just want to go to sleep and never wake up, that is a de facto suicidal comment. Take that seriously. There is no such thing as, oh, they just want attention with these lines and therefore I'm just going to ignore it. Okay? You're not in a position to make that risk assessment. So anyone who does make those comments, if it's not them themselves going to get help, then you need to prompt them to go and get help. Because you can say, I am worried about the comments that you've made. You know, Have you thought about getting help? I'm really worried about you. There are always important ways in how you, how you put that. Seek help early. Mentors, the private health systems, the Victorian... Um, doctors, the VHDB, so the Health for Doctors program and a number of other ones that we're going to put up there. Trust your self-diagnosis. You know, I've given you the symptoms, but if you yourself feel, oh, you know, I, I think I might have some depression, don't ignore that and don't sort of put down, well, I'm not a doctor, how can I say that about myself? Actually, think about it and talk to your own doctor about it because you're short of confidentiality. Talk to a mentor or seek other sorts of help, but do trust your self-diagnosis. Family and friends are absolutely vital, and this is where the isolation is an issue, because if you don't keep up with your family and friends, you're going to have a lack of support. Denial is not going to work. Can I say decrease in alcohol and stop the drug use anymore? Sleep and eat well. Medicine offers you many opportunities. Match your personality and interests with a manageable career. Um, don't always just pick the thing that you think is the most glamorous profession. If, you're, if it doesn't suit your personality, then don't do it. Know yourself and know what it is that you actually are interested in and that will make for a manageable life balance. <laughs> Family and friends stay connected. Don't forget things like music, art, literature, nature, sports, travel. They are really important enhancers of life and quality of life. And I would say, if you're not doing it already, program in at least 30 minutes of drug-free fun <laughs> every, every day, if you can. I just can't help it, but these are my favourite TV psychiatrists. Psychiatrists are portrayed pretty badly in most of, um, most of the media, but um, I did love Sydney Friedman in um, MASH. And the female psychiatrist, whose name I've forgotten, in The Sopranos, was actually, she actually gets a reasonable Guernsey, but most other female psychiatrists end up sleeping with their patients, which is a no-no. <laughs> and the other thing is also, don't sleep with your consultants. It never, ever, ever leads to anything good. Okay, so there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Karen, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here um, from a Headspace perspective and to sort of fill you in a little bit about Headspace, but I guess also, just ha also more importantly, to just have a, an open conversation about mental health and, and depression in particular. So I'll, um, I'll talk a bit about Headspace firstly. If, put your hand up if you've, if you've heard of Headspace. That's good. That's probably the best response I've ever had. Um, but to give you a brief sort of uh, overview, um, there's over 60 centres now across Australia. Um, there's quite a few very close to here. I think there's five within that 25 minute drive. The closest ones would probably be sort of the Danny Nong Headspace Centre and the Elstonwick one. And there's also one about to be open in Narry Warren, I think soon. Um, I actually, knowing that tonight was coming up, I, I gave the, the GP at the National Office um, a call to just sort of see if there's anything I, worth mentioning to you guys. And um, he was excited that I called because they're, they're actually at the moment trying to implement some, some training opportunities for GPs. Um, there's over 100 GPs employed through Headspace in some, in, at the centres in some capacity. Um, and there's quite a lot of information on the website I've, I've left um, a few sort of brochures and things just out on the table um, out that way if you want to know more. But I um, encourage you all to have a look at the GP um, section of the website and um, have a look for some training programs that might be coming up based on obviously youth mental health um, for general practitioners. Um, but I guess the main reason I'm here tonight is to fill you in on my personal story um, around depression. 
Um, Karen alluded to the fact that I was uh, at Geelong Footy Club for six years, which was an amazing experience. I was uh, drafted at the end of 2006 um, and finished up there, retired in, at the end of 2012. And retired is a bit of a strange word to use, but I was um, 24 and um, I guess realised that that life wasn't for me and I wasn't getting many games at Geelong either, so that didn't help. Um, but I guess I'll run you through my um, the stories that the the series of depressive episodes that came up, and I know it can be quite hard to pop your hand up if someone's telling a personal story, um, but I really encourage you to put your hand up and, and ask questions as we go. Um, if you want me to expand on on certain areas as I talk, um, obviously there'll be the same sort of question time at the end. But please feel free and don't be um, be shy about asking anything um, personal because I'll, uh, I'll try and be as open as I can and, and there's nothing that's, that's too personal for me. Um, my first episode uh, of depression came at the end of uh, pre-season coming into the 2009 season. So it was about uh, this time of the year in 2009 and it really did... Uh, come out of nowhere a little bit. I grew up in Warrnambool at a great school, but a school that um, didn't really talk about mental health. Um, I never really knew much about it. Uh, didn't have any people in my family or close friendship group who, who had experiences. So I guess the conversations nearly re never really came up and I, I guess, was living a life um, where I thought, Perhaps that's not something I have to worry about. Um, much to my, um, I guess, harsh learnings, I realised that, that depression can, can really happen to anyone. Um, and particularly, I guess, people in jobs that do have pretty high expectations. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities between perhaps medical students and young footballers and, and um, doctors and... and uh, and AFL footballers and their positioning in, in the society and the expectation that society places on them. It's been alluded to a couple of times tonight, the pressures that you guys face, both as, as students and will face um, going forward. And there's quite a lot of parallels to, uh, to the life of a footballer. For me, um, the initial signs were mostly around the behavioural things um, that Professor Kilkarni mentioned. Um, the sort of change, the, the avoiding, um, withdrawing from friendship groups, um, sort of going to training but saying I was a bit sore and, and not really um, committing to it. I went, I did go and seek um, some advice from the GP but I explained it in a way that um, I guess I was trying to make sure that he thought it was physical, a physical illness that I was going through. Um, and wasn't probably completely open about the thoughts that, that I was experiencing and the um, sort of self-doubts I was, I was having. Um, this sort of went on for a few weeks where I was able to just get by, I was able to um, get through the day, uh, I wouldn't say ever feeling great, but get through nonetheless, was able to sleep okay, because I was so exhausted, but would then wake up at about five in the morning and would be stressed out of my brain about the upcoming day um, and the upcoming games and, and basically the, yeah, all the expectations I, I had on myself um, and I thought everyone else had on me. Over those three weeks, things got progressively worse. Um, to sort of fast track the story a little bit, um, I went and saw a few different psychologists and eventually found one that um, felt right, and, and um, that's one thing I'll, I'll mention now. If, if you are seeking help, don't get, um, I guess, um, demoralised from not building a good relationship with the first person you go and see. A lot of the time it takes months to, feel, to, to um, form a really good mental health team for you. Um, Thankfully, I was able to see quite a few different people quite quickly and, and found some people that really worked. Um, 
I got onto medication at this point and um, the trials and tribulations of going onto antidepressants aren't much, much fun. There's a lot of side effects with quite a few. Um, so it's about finding one that worked to, to lift my mood but also limit those, those side effects. <coughs> Excuse me. Eventually thought we had a really good plan and a really good uh, team going. And over the course of about a week, um, right at the start, I think it was, it was coming into round two, um, my mood and my behaviours just dropped very, very quickly. Um, I became quite suicidal. I um, was living with some, some really good mates at the time who made sure I was sort of with someone, um, did all the, right, all the right things, but I felt like I was a real um, burden to those, to those guys and to some people around me. So with the club and my family, decided to actually go and spend some time at the, the Melbourne Clinic, one of the psychiatric hospitals in Melbourne, obviously. Um, I had three weeks at the clinic and as I said earlier I had no sort of um, mental health education growing up and I guess this three week period I used to get as much education as I could in a safe environment, um, try some, some different, different um, therapies and things and um, I guess have some time to just forget about everything else and worry about what's, what's best for me. I, uh, I came out of hospital and, the, and the, the footy club were fantastic. They um, set up all these, these um, medical interventions that were required, but they were also very, very open and, and sort of, um, I guess, they made conversations come about with, with the teammates and, and the guys and made them sort of use it as an educational resource as well. Uh, I'll mention that one of the most important things I had in my whole experience of going to hospital was the fact that it was then out in the public um, and more importantly everyone in my life and who I dealt with on a day to day basis now knew. I didn't have to hide anything anymore. Um, I'd obviously told some people previously to, the, to going to hospital but not the broader, broader community and not the broader footy club. Um, mostly because of that that stigma and I'm not going to lie that I thought um, I, was, I was embarrassed, I thought I was weak because of the culture um, I was in and, and the expectations that I put on footballers and myself as a footballer and I guess a young male. Um, the things I, I, I gained out of that forced openness uh, was incredibly positive. The the, the, the number of phone calls and messages and things I received from guys um, wishing me well was great, and, and, but probably not surprising um, in a way. It was more the, the openness other guys had about their own experiences and their own battles, and, and um, a lot of guys had had some sort of mental health problem over the years, um, and if not them, almost everyone had someone in their family or a close friend. Um, so everyone was able to be quite empathetic and was able to sort of understand and not and that allowed me to not feel like I was being being judged um, and that was an incredibly powerful thing it, it, having that that openness um, really fast tracked my recovery I, I feel um, so after that three weeks in hospital I slowly got back to some sort of normal routines um, got back doing the things I loved, um, exercising and, and, and playing footy and um, probably about six weeks after I was first admitted to the hospital was, was playing a bit of footy in the VFL um, which is quite a um, quick recovery obviously. Um, my downfall was quite quick and thankfully so was my recovery. Um, and me being still quite young and um, I guess in an environment where um, you work, you, you work towards something, and then you achieve it, and you sort of move on. Um, I've almost approached my mental health uh, in that way, and thought I dealt with it. I'd, that was my um, depression done. I can sort of tick that off and 
coast along. I was, I was still on medication and still seeing a psychologist reasonably regularly. Um, but much to my detriment, um, I thought that was it. So similar time frame, um, similar time in the next two years, I had um, severe depressive episodes again that lasted for sort of periods of, of three to four months. Thankfully, no longer. Um, but still major, major impairment of my um, life at the time and of my footy career. Um, over those other, those subsequent episodes, I realised that mental health isn't a, isn't a one-off thing and, and depression isn't a one-off thing. Uh, it's um, an ongoing, I guess, life journey. For me particularly, I guess I had some susceptibilities to depression. Um, but I think for everyone in terms of men mental health, it is a real lifelong journey that um, you continually pick up on things and continually improve your own level of well-being um, in some capacity. So through, through, through those episodes and uh, doing more work with psychologists and psychiatrists, changing things, um, I realised quite a few things about, about myself. And this is one of the, if not the, the best thing that comes out of suffering from some sort of mental health is the, the self-reflection you need to do and the, I guess, um, looking inside at what really is important to yourself and um, what matters most. Those sort of que that sort of questioning led me to retire from footy, as I, as I mentioned, and um, I'm now finishing off my education, um, my, a, a, doing a science degree and working at Headspace and this has become a passion for me, spreading the word on, on the importance of um, learning about mental health, on, on educating yourself, on knowing what resources are available if things don't, don't go so well um, and more importantly about really trying to destigmatise the mental health depression uh, sort of the, the stigma that comes with those things for everyone but I think particularly for, for young people who are trying to excel in, in different areas and who, are, who do find it really hard to put their hand up um, and say I need help and it does take uh, I guess a lot of guts at the time um, as I said it was almost forced upon me um, to, to really go and seek help but as a, as a group of students going through together, um, I couldn't implore you more to start having conversations amongst yourselves around what you do to keep well and what coping strategies you, you do. And I was um, very excited when I saw the question for the night um, showed earlier in the, the, um, the text line around um, how do you cope with stress? Because working out those things and working out what things make you happy um, they're paramount to your mental health and to your success in whatever field it is and um, just paramount to, to living a, a full and, and well life in general. Um, I'll, I'll let you in on I guess a few things that, that I now do to improve my well-being. Um, a few activities have been talked about and, and, and there's, there's been great. I think the 30 minutes of fun one is, is great and thinking about what does what what makes you happy, um, what activities you genuinely enjoy and genuinely can do to escape the stresses. Um, I love snowboarding and surfing and um, part of the reason why I finished up at footy was so I could start doing those things and um, not feel bad about maybe breaking a leg or something. So that, um, so I take the opportunity to, to get out and, and do that as much as I can, as well as mountain biking. Um, so sort of all very very active type things, but they're the things that work for me. I still play footy um, at an amateur level, which I'm really enjoying, and I love keeping fit in, in that footy club environment. It has, um, much like I think the, the medical student fraternity was, was mentioned with the macho sort of culture, footy culture does have that but I think it's been very humbling from my experience um, going to uh, a new footy club and 
them knowing my story with, with mental health battles and that allowing some conversations to flow and some people to sort of ask questions around um, what it's like to see a psychologist and what it's like to um, go through something like depression. Um, I'm always, I feel excited that young, fellow young people are asking me these sort of questions and, and are genuinely interested in, in what goes on in, in certain um, mental health problems. Um, another thing I do, um, Jeff talked about how he gets up and, um, every morning and uh, is thanks whoever that he's alive and um, is, is wrapped and excited about the day ahead and I think that's great. I do it at the end of the day actually and um, throughout my whole experience I've had uh, been very lucky to have a, a great girlfriend who I now live with um, and we sort of try and do um, I guess a, a gratitude exercise where we sort of ask each other and this sounds really corny and I don't normally tell the groups this so <laughs> this is a bit embarrassing no. um, but talk about um, what made you happy throughout the day and try and focus on little moments like it might be the sun um, that when you're riding home the sunset that was happening or um, little things that I think as young people with um, phones and, and things you just you don't worry about noticing those things and you don't sort of acknowledge them um, but that's been that was a thing suggested by my psychologist about six months ago and it's really um, helped me to, to appreciate little things people do for me or um, <laughs> you know, the smile someone gives or whatever it is. Um, so that's a really good exercise I've found. Um, and you can feel free to use it. It's not my... my I'm not, it's not copyrighted or anything. Um, and I'll sort of um, bring it back to what I always sort of try and finish on. Normally I speak to um, high school students and, and younger, younger guys. So it's... Um, try and keep it a bit more simple for them. But... Um, try and get them sort of either now or, or, or later that night to um, acknowledge the things that they do to keep well like I mentioned, mentioned earlier the, the things that genuinely make them happy and um, the things that really do get them away from the stresses of their, their everyday life so um, that's the thing I'll, I'll sort of really get you to take home is do that individually Take, write it down, do whatever you want, just think about it. Um, couldn't encourage it anymore. And I guess the other, the main thing I want you guys to take home is that you guys are really the leaders in breaking down that stigma um, in the medical student um, faculty, but also in the, in the broader community. I think the, um, as much as I love coming out and talking about my experience with depression and um, I guess spruiking headspace and and, hel and sit, um, help seeking and, and and all those sorts of things. It's really up to the, the everyone to to start conversations, to sort of educate themselves, and just to be to be open if they are having a rough time. Um, and that will really be what breaks down the stigma. Thank you.